Thanks again for not being here Tuesday. That was a little unexpected, but it also had to do with this visitor that I have uh, in town. Um, so uh, anyway, that's that's why Dr. Bellhoff had to teach for you guys on, on Tuesday, and I think he went over the impasse method. So the last last week when I finished, we had. The well, last time we met in class, when I was here, we derived all the equations for two-phase flow, for, or um, uh, and or we put it into a, into a form uh, where we had one sort of overall mass balance equation and then one saturation equation. Uh, you could either use oil or water, and then you're going to solve those in a coupled manner, um, well, loosely coupled in the sense that when we moved on to the discretizing, and then we're going to solve the, the pressure equation, the linear equation for pressure implicitly, and then we're going to solve for the, or update the saturations explicitly. And so I think he went through all of that, and on the left is the implicit equation uh, for pressure, and while it looks the same as it did before, just you do have to remember that the, the transmissibility matrix includes two terms, right? The, the sort of oil transmissibility and the water transmissibility, and they're added together. So when you write it compactly, it's the same equation, but uh, in the in the actual components of what's in T is a little bit different, and then in the saturations over there. Okay, there is a the the method of impasse is is only it, it's partially explicit, so there is a condition on the stability, and that comes from the CFL condition right there, um, and then upwinding must be used to determine the half relative permeability. So did he talk much about upwinding? Um, so I, I thought I would just sort of uh, show a little bit about why that's necessary and where it comes from. I don't know. Uh, I don't think he went into as much detail as I'm going to show here. Um, I think I need to. So if we look at that overall balance equation, So if you look at the overall balance equation, it looks like that, right? And I'm just going to focus on this one term right here for a second. So if we, if we look at that term and we use the product rule to distribute the derivatives, and I'm going to assume that the permeability K, mu, and Bw are constant. So I'm going to pull those guys out. So I'm going to have K, mu, Bw there. But then I'm going to, you know, the, the relative permeability is a function of the saturation, which is a function of space, right? X. Okay, it, it can change from location to location, right? We're cha we're solving for it, so you know it's going to be different in each grid block, right? Um, so, so here what you'll have is uh, the partial of the relative permeability with respect to X times partial P with respect to X plus relative permeability times partial squared p x squared, OK? So if you distribute this, this spatial derivative on the outside, you get something like that. 
And if you did that to both terms, so I'm only looking at the second term there, but if I did it to the first term also, and then I just grouped all the coefficients out in front, the things that I'm calling constants, right? Ultimately, I would have some equation that would be something like some coefficient a times dp dt equal to, that's, so that's sort of all the stuff on the right side, times uh, some coefficient b times uh, dp dx plus some coefficient c <coughs> times d squared dp dx squared. Okay. So those a, b's, and c's, I'm just grouping all those terms because it's not really important to the discussion here. Okay. So does anybody know, like in a very generic mathematical sense, what you'd call this equation? So you ever heard of like convection or maybe advection, convection diffusion equation? or advection diffusion equation. So diffusion is this, diffusion is characterized by this second derivative in x, right? And advection is characterized by this first diffusion in x. So when you have both of them showing up, it's called the advection or, some advection and convection are very similar. It really just depends on what's in B. But, uh, you know, so you call this the advection diffusion equation or convection diffusion equation. So does anybody know the, do you know the difference between, like physically, what the difference is between advection and convection, advection and diffusion? Okay, so imagine that I'm standing here with a big torch, big Olympic-sized torch, right? And if the room is kind of cold, right? If I lit that torch and I stood here long enough, even without moving, it would heat the whole room up, right? So even if you're sitting over there in the back of the room, eventually you'd feel warmer because I lit that torch. Right? So the process that the heat moves throughout the room in that scenario is diffusion. Right? So if I lie to also something else interesting about at least the mathematics of diffusion, uh, if I light the torch, even if you're sitting in the back of the room, how long does it take for the heat to get to you? And just imagine, you know, how, how long would it take? If you're sitting in the back of the room, just take a guess. I mean, what? If I, I mean, I know I don't really have a torch, so you, you're probably wondering, well, how big is your torch, right? But think of if I had an Olympic-sized torch, like a flame like this. Right? I'm holding it here. And you're sitting in the back of the room. How long would it take for you to feel one degree warmer? Five minutes, ten minutes, an hour? Right? I guess I, I ruined my question when I said one degree. Because that, that actually puts a time frame. Anyway, the, 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 what I was getting at is, and it's something about the mathematics of the problem, is actually instantly, the second I light this torch, if you're sitting on Jupiter, you would feel, you should feel a little bit warmer. All right? The problem is, is that it'd be so small, you, I mean, you can't actually feel it, right? The, but the point I was trying to make is that diffusion is actually an instantaneous process. Right? So the, the concentration of heat would, you know, before you could actually feel something, would take a lot longer, right? But technically, statistically, particles would be making their way instantaneously to you. And so if, if the equation, of the B were zero in that equation, and you had a pure, let's call it a pure diffusion equation, and that's Right, if B equals equals zero, that's the single phase homogeneous case, right? That's what we talked about earlier in the semester. That's the diffusivity equation. In that case, information travels at an infinite speed. Okay? However, if B is not zero and you have that convective term, so what's convection? So if, if diffusion is I'm standing here with a torch and you're waiting on the heat to get to you, diffusion is, I mean convection is I'm walking towards you with the torch, and you're going to feel that. You're going to feel the heat faster because I'm moving towards you. I'm physically moving the torch towards you. Right? That's convection. Okay. And so, 
you can have, you know, if you imagine that somebody's standing on the other side of the room and I'm standing over here and I light my torch and I begin to walk toward you like this. I'm technically advecting the heat towards you. Right? I'm moving towards you. Torch is moving towards you. So eventually, at some point, you're going to feel the torch because I get closer to you. However, you're likely, in that scenario, where I'm, where I'm moving that slow, you're going to feel the heat from diffusion faster than you feel the heat from convection. I mean, eventually, you're going to feel both of them. But in that case, the, I'm walking so slow towards you with the torch, the room's going to heat up, so, heat up faster due to diffusion than the fact that I'm moving towards you. Okay? But the counterexample is obvious, right? If I'm walking, if I'm racing towards you, right, you're, you're going to feel the heat due to convection faster than you're going to feel it from diffusion, even though diffusion is clearly still occurring. All right? So that's sort of the difference in advection and diffusion. And in the case where you have an advected, so the way we characterize an equation like the one I wrote right there, and it depends on the ratio of what's in those coefficients, but we use terms like parabolic, hyperbolic, elliptic. You ever heard those? If you ever take a course in, in partial differential equations, you'll hear that, some, those n names. So as it's written, it's a parabolic equation. Well, in general, it's a parabolic equation, except in the case when advection dominates. So in other words, if B is much larger than C, and, and there's other real physical variables. If I actually assign real physical num uh, coefficients in front of there uh, for actual like flows, then there would be something called a pecklet number. You ever heard of a pecklet number? The pecklet number is sort of the ratio of advective transport to diffusive transport. And so when that pecklet number is above two, that's what we call an advection or convection dominated flow. Okay? In a convection dominated flow, we have to use upwind. Now why? Okay. So well, the reason is, is the equation becomes hyperbolic, or at least nearly hyperbolic. It would be truly hyperbolic if C was zero, if there's no diffusion at all. Yeah? So do you have a change of relative point of order for some of these parasites to be accepted in your equation? Exactly. Uh, yes. Because there's another, like, there's another variable. Yeah, because, you know, at any time, right, we, the, the relative permeability comes from the saturation curve, and we, it's sort of a constitutive model. We just look it up. So at, at, any point, at any time, T, that's just sort of a number, right? But anyway, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so the equation becomes nearly hyperbolic, right? And, and what, what hyperbolic equations have are something called characteristics, okay? And characteristics basically propagate initial conditions or discontinuities in initial conditions throughout the solution. And the classic example of this is the wave equation. So even though it's a different type of um, hyperbolic equation, I think it's the, probably the most useful one to, to use as an example. So the wave equation would be like, um, do you... Uh, du dt squared, so the, the difference in, is we have a squared there, is equal to c squared du squared dx squared, okay? And we use the wave equation, this is, I mean the wave equation is, you know, when you, when you hear that little acoustic wave when I knock on a piece of wood, right, that, that's the acoustic wave tra traveling, the sound traveling through the wood, okay? And, and so this is, this is actually how it's kind of odd, like, if I were to take this pen and whack it like that and fly through the air, you with your slow eyes would just see it fly through the air. I would normally, if I didn't have such, if this is like my only pen, I would, I would actually whack it <laughs> and let it fly. But anyway, if I whack this pen and I let it fly through the air, you with your slow eyes would just see it fly like, like a rigid body, right? But if you had a really fast camera, and we have cameras fast enough to see this, 
if we have a really fast camera and you can look at one end of it, when you whack it, this end over here doesn't know it's been hit yet because the wave has to travel to that end. And so if you can look at the, if you can look at the very end of it fast enough with a really fast camera, what you'd see is that you whack it here and it takes time. If this pin were steel, it would take the time, you know, steel has a wave speed of 5,050 meters per second. So it would take that much time, you know, t um, you know, divided by the length, you know, a few nanoseconds, for the wave to get there, and then you'd see this end move like that. And then the wave would reflect and go back to the other side and reflect again and reflect again. And so if you can look at the end of a bar or a pin, right, what you'd actually see is instead of it moving like a rigid body, it actually moves like this. Everything moves like that, actually. You just, your eye's too slow to see it. Okay? So, if I idealize my pin as a bar, right, and I whack the end of the bar with a hammer, okay, and I whack the end of the bar such that I have some initial displacement, if I look at the displacement as a position, right, so this is this is u as a function of position. All right. At some time, I measure where it's at. Because I, because I whacked it with a hammer, I have a very, very sharp front like this. And I'm going to propagate along. So this is at like time t equals 0. Right. Some point later in time, or time t equals t1, we're going to assume my, my bar is this. It's perfectly homogeneous. There's no dissipation or anything. So my wave just travels along undisturbed. It, its initial condition is carried through undisturbed, specifically the discontinuity here. Okay, It just travels along. And so uh, now, this is, a, this is in the continuum. I mean, this is a continuous solution to the wave equation. would be something like this. But if we wanted to solve that and discreetly, we need to do a spatial discretization. Okay? So if we go in here, and this is space, remember, this is x. Right? So we're going to do a spatial discretization. I'm going to break x up into discrete points. And let's say we want to compute the derivative here, which technically is undefined. This is a sharp shock, right? Technically, it's, it, it's undefined. But we're going to try to numerically compute it. We're going to use a central difference method to do it. So if I use a central difference method, so I take a point, you know, so this is i, this is i plus 1, this is i minus 1, right? Then a central difference approximation to my derivative is u at i plus 1 minus u at i minus 1 over 2 delta x, right? Right? Where, where this is delta x. Right? So u at i plus 1 is clearly 0. Right? This is u. u at i plus 1 is clearly 0. And u at i minus 1 is about right there. Right? About right there. So our derivative looks something like that, which is clearly, you know, the derivative is the slope of this curve, right? So, I mean, you might argue, well, it's undefined here, and I might say, well, you know, we're trying to solve it one step in one instant in time in the future, and at one instant in time in the future, this point's going to be there. And so what we're really looking for is the derivative here. But whatever your argument, it, it's either straight, it's either undefined or it's that. It's it's not this for sure. Right? It's either undefined or it's that. Right? So this is why we need upwinding. Our discretization has to match the physics of the problem. And the physics of the problem say that, that 
you know, there's some characteristic or some front that's going to be, the initial condition is going to be propagated through <coughs> no matter what we do. And this is due to the nature of advection. Okay? And so what we need to do to take this derivative, then, is we're going to use of winding. So instead, you know, we're going to evaluate the derivative between the point i and i minus 1. over delta x, right? And so, and, and the velocity, we're always going to do this in a way that opposes the velocity. So this, in, in this case, the wave's traveling that way. So, and this is the derivative we want, the slope there, which is just a constant, or zero, I mean, zero, rather. Um, so we, we'll, always, we'll always compute the derivative in the direction, if the velocity vector is pointing that way, we're going to look backwards in our upwinding scheme, right? And so this is where, uh, in those relative permeability, oh, let's, uh, before I go back to the slides, let's look at one more thing. What actually are we doing when we add this extra? or when we use this upwinding scheme, what are we actually doing? Right? So if you'll allow me to write, uh, you know, similar to what the way I just did, I'm just going to get rid of, sort of get rid of the coefficients. Um, well, no, I don't have to. Well, I have a dp dt equals B P D X um, plus D P D squared D X squared. Did I have D or I'd see there, right? Anyway. Um, so let's let's now do a spatial discretization of that. So we're not going to discretize time. It's not important to what we our discussion here. But let's do a spatial discretization of that, of that guy. So if I do that, then I have uh, A, DP, I, T, and I'm going to use I'm going to use my upwinding scheme here on the convective term. I'm going to use a central difference scheme on the diffusive term. And if I just rearrange that equation, then you get this. So after rearranging, now I have on my convective term what looks like an ordinary central difference scheme on the convective term plus an ordinary, so this is central difference on the first derivative, this is central difference on the second derivative, but I have this extra term that adds to my diffusion coefficient, right? So C would just be the, you know, the strength of diffusion, right? The diffusion coefficient. So now I've added something to it. So in other words, you know, or say, saying this in words, I, I added some artificial or numerical diffusion, right? 
So that's what we're, that's really what we do. We have an invective dominated flow. We're going to add some diffusion to it to help stabilize it. And that's what the upwinding does. Yeah. It's supposed to be delta x. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, it should be right there. So. I think it's okay. Anyway, should be fine. The, but yeah, the idea is by doing the upwinding, what we're doing is adding some artificial diffusion to help stabilize the problem. Because if we don't do that and we try to compute those derivatives at the front, they're going to be way wrong, right? And that's what gives you the instability because the derivative is way wrong at the, at the front, like we just talked about. So uh, then back to the slides. I didn't do a good job putting everything in place. <coughs> 